I'm Dean Walker, and I'd like to welcome you to the Poetry of Predicament, a podcast for people brave enough to face humanity's challenges and problems, and most importantly, our numerous predicaments. The Poetry of Predicament is a podcast meant to inspire us to bring forth grace, beauty, and connection with the web of life in the face of a predicament-laden world. This episode of Poetry of Predicament, join us in welcoming our guest, Elizabeth West. All right. I am absolutely thrilled here on the Poetry of Predicament, to be welcoming Elizabeth West, an author, uh, a writer of a a number of different websites and um, places where we can now publish our our written wares out on the interwebs. And um, from the first piece that I read uh, of yours, Elizabeth, I was just really taken by what what a strong fit I feel between the work that uh, Carolyn Baker and myself are creating in our various podcasts and websites and all that stuff, and your articles. There's just such a um, resonance that I am thrilled that we get a chance to hear from you today and connect with you today. Um, So if, um, if you don't mind, I'd love to just start by asking you to Um, Give us a little picture of what has been your life up till now. What got you to this place of this kind of resonance with um, an orientation that I would call a a heartful way of living in the face of a predicament-laden world? Elizabeth, hello. Welcome. Hi. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and I would echo your sentiment about the fit. It's Hmm. it's It's a great grace to uh, just stumble upon fellow travelers who have the same kind of perspective, Mm. especially in this time. Um, Me, I've been a traveler through many worlds. I think I've had a pretty funny and eclectic life. I've done a lot of different things. Um, I was a chef and a restaurant owner of high-end restaurants in Boston and New York when I was much younger. And I went on to work Uh, with battered women, to teach culinary students, and to start needle exchange. Um, And I have two daughters who I have raised and who have taught me a great deal. Um, But that's sort of the outer contours. The, The inner picture is one of someone who always, I think, knew that what I saw around me was worth paying attention to, um, that the world needed to be looked at critically and understood from that perspective, but also that there were other worlds, there were other realities, and that they were also imperative to understand and to live. And so I look around me, I've been looking for years and years and years, and watching the trajectory of our planet and not just what's happening to the planet and all the living beings on it, but the way in which as humans who basically are in the driver's seat, um, or at least seemingly in the driver's seat, um, the way that we have responded to our predicament. And that perhaps is the most alarming part of it Mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. We have information We have creativity, we have resources, we had options. We still have options, but they are much narrower than they were 20 years ago. And I think that I'm very passionate about our pursuing those options that we still have at this moment in time, because it does seem like we may not have that much more time. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we don't know how it's all going to unfold. We don't know, um, you know, what will become of any of us individually. But I think we can be pretty sure 
if we look at the evidence, at the sober data that you have outlined so excellently, um, I think we can be pretty confident that there is going to be disruption to our life. There is going to be destruction in our life. Many of us will perish, um, and as will many of our fellow life forms here on this planet. Um, you know, where it all ends, you know, this is new. You know, nobody knows. Nobody has the map exactly. Mm -hmm. I think. Anyway, I don't. But um, given that, it strikes me that this is a moment to really sit up and pay attention. Mm. Um, and I noticed that you used that <laughs> phrase on your living resilience website, you know, that that was one of the things that we need to do. Um, but, you know, Dean, I want to say that in my personal life, and I suspect you probably will resonate with this, as will many of your listeners, the times of greatest duress, of suffering, of impossibility, you know, when I have faced things that I thought, I can't do this, I can't possibly do this, those have been the times of greatest transformation and growth and they have been the greatest gifts. And I see the time that we're living in now as, you know, sort of a mega form of that, of the personal challenge. Um, it really is an invitation and a goad at the same time. And I think I find myself thinking about, um, do you know the shamanic concept of the petty tyrant? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that we do encounter in our lives these forces sometimes often in the form of another person, um, but, you know, it could be something else, um, that really challenge us, that push our buttons, that, that force us to dig deep into what it is we really have or own as resources, internal resources, and um, make choices about who we want to be, how we want to live. Um, what kind of energy we want to carry through the world. Mm. So to me, in some ways, this is, this is, I would have to say, a very sacred time. There is so much potential here, so much opportunity. Um, there's no reason in general. I mean, people may have their own specific and individual reasons, but I think overall, we need to be looking at business as usual. And um, for many of us, there's really no need to, you know, continue plodding along the path that seemed like it was laid out for us, you know, when we were young. I think um, we have the chance to say, you know, I may not be alive in 15 years. I mean, none of us may be anyway, but, but I think that, that the reality, the facts that we know encourage us to look at this more urgently. And, you know, I can say, oh, you know, that survival tape I have running in my head that says, I can't say what I think to this person or I can't uh, set my own boundaries or whatever it happens to be because, you know, they might abandon me and not love me and I might die, um, which, you know, are rooted in, you know, early childhood and are absolutely no use to me today. Well, I could work on that for the next 20 years if I had 20 years and slowly chip away at it. But, but the imperative is, you know, fling that out the window now because it's really stupid and it's restrictive and it's diminishing and I want to live as fully as I can both as a human being and as a divine being mm. in the time that's here for me and I certainly want to encourage anybody else who's interested in doing that to do it too fling the crap out the window um, mm. don't wait till tomorrow there's no time like the present um, truly yeah the words that come to mind when you're saying that is um, reclaiming our agency. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a particular track that I, I went, ended up uh, 
going down in the book with um, noticing the, the immense costs of how business as usual has demanded of us to disconnect from our deeper selves, from each other, and from Earth. That was kind of the, the unspoken agreement was if you want to profit from this, if you want to play in this luxurious fossil fuel driven game, mm -hmm. then you mm -hmm. need to cut off those signals because those signals will make you less effective as an executive in a corporation or less oh, compromise so your on. ability to play that game. Absolutely. And so when you're saying what you're saying, it, it rings for me like when I take on practices that, that reconnect me with those primary sources of meaning, you know, my, my relatedness with myself, mm -hmm. my relatedness with others and my relatedness with earth. And of course, spirit and soul and so on. There is an innate return to agency, a return to a, a sense of being able to live in full presence again which mm -hmm. was really never there as much as we love to talk it up like oh you can be more powerful today by just doing this life hack but if we re truly reconnect with these sources of meaning we it just as a matter of like breathing that sense of agency returns so that's what i was brought to when you were describing your your take on things and I'm, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind just kind of bridging from where you were to speaking a little bit about this most recent writing in dissident voice um what had what prompted you to put out this particular piece of work i think what you know, what prompts me always is spirit. Um, you know, I, I'm not really in charge of this process. I write when something descends and I just say, okay, fine. I'm here. I'm at the keyboard. I will do, I will do everything I can to translate this. But, but Dean, I think I was actually really in a period where I was deeply experiencing my connection with the natural world and really kind of been, I, I was pointed back in that direction over and over and over again over a period of time where I really was like, just, just sit with this rock, you know, just sit there and, um, you know, just watch this moth for as long as it's available. And, you know, there was a heightened sense for me. I mean, I've certainly experienced this before, but it was it was more profound than I'd ever encountered before for myself of just the absolute fulfillment and joy of connecting with other forms of consciousness in a way that was um, that was was uh, reciprocal reciprocal that's the word um it was mutual and um i felt like i was bowing down and you know the rock was bowing down to me and there was such a sense of fullness wholeness completeness that i felt in that experience and it you know led me to think about being hungry. Actually, I myself found that I wasn't nearly as hungry as I had been. Mm -hmm. It was like, that's really wild. Um, you know, we know that food is complicated. It's another, you know, mm -hmm. mechanism for manipulating our mood, shall we say. Um, but it was, uh, it was really fascinating to me to, to actually just watch how quickly and how um, powerfully that changed my physical being. Mm -hmm. And it made me think about how much we eat and how much, I mean, you know, we eat a lot of garbage too, but, but you know, even, even when we don't eat garbage, if it's possible anymore, um, we're trying to feed something that doesn't get sated with food. All right. Would, would you remind me the title uh, yes, it's is it nature to nurture. Nature as nurture, nurture as and nurture. as an angel. And I, I spoke a great deal about um, 
about indigenous societies, perhaps, uh, particularly prior to the Neolithic. Um, so the subtitle was Ancient Lessons for Sacred Sustenance. Mm. Um, and, you know, obviously there are individuals and there are groups of individuals um, who continue to um, feed themselves with an understanding of their place in the web of life, uh, the balance, the, um, the nature of the exchange um, that has to happen when we feed ourselves. Um, but most of us, at least in the industrialized world, are pretty far distant from that. You know, things come in packages and in yeah. freezing freezers and, you know, cans and, you know, we don't, we don't have a way of really honoring the other beings that are, that are giving us life. Right. And we may not, I think I said in my article, I'll probably continue to go buy my produce from the farmers who grow it. I won't be, you know, I live in the city. I'm not going to be, you know, doing much more than peripheral gardening. Yeah. I have a couple of fruit trees and I talk to them, but um, at the same time, I can still, I can talk to my fruit trees. I can talk, talk to my spruce tree. I can talk to, you know, the, I can talk to the, the grasses that, you know, get overgrown in my yard. They're all full of wisdom and delight. It sounds a little loony, but it's true. Try it if you haven't. Yeah. Well, it, I, I, we haven't talked much about w how we each grew up, but I, I think that there's some parallel. I um, was exposed a, an awful lot to um, kind of the Southwest desert and the desert in Baja and some shamanic um, realities qu quite early on. And, and they blended remarkably well with some other um, really ex greatly expanding experiences later in life that um, the, the only word I've been able to find f to fit it is grace. Mm -hmm. And I've never been a, a religious person at mm -hmm. all. In fact, if anything, I've had a very antagonistic re uh, relationship with religion. Yeah. But I've had since putting out the book, The Impossible Conversation, I've had more impossible conversations than I can count with people very different from myself, people who are fundamentalist religious folks, and, but who had a lot to say when I showed some curiosity about uh, if they had experienced anything that they might call grace. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sitting there for hours in a coffee shop with someone that before we wouldn't have given each other the time of day. And so what you, what you were just talking about reminds me of that, that, that state of being that you were describing, whether or not you're growing a lot of food on your particular property, is not at all, I think, relevant compared to this always available, always just a... a thin veil of distance between my business as usual way of deploying my attention. Exactly. And then just piercing through that thin veil and there is this expansion. Always there. In which time disappears and judgment is can't be found. And all the usual constructs that we carry around with us and are so busy in our day mm -hmm crippling ourselves with just fall away and so I was hearing that when you were describing the state of being that went along with the mm -hmm. realization about food does that spark anything well yeah it does actually um you know I I uh, like you do not have a you know a religious upbringing to speak of um although I think that there was you know, a, a, a longing for that in my childhood, for me and, and my family. Um, so what I know about, you know, religious paths is, is what I've learned since I've grown up. Um, so in some ways, not so deeply embedded, but, you know, it, it made me think, Dean, about um, Paul Tillich, who was a, 
Christian theologian, um, defining sin as separation, um, which I found to be a very powerful and, and true um, thinking about, about how we live, really, or don't live. And, you know, and I, I was also just um, reading um, Martin Luther King's um, letter from Birmingham jail, where one of the things that he noted that I just, I just loved was that um, he said, we don't, we don't have um, disappointment except where there's love. That's a paraphrase. But, um, and, and I thought, and nor do we have grief or anger. You know, that those emotions, which we tend to consider negative, arise in direct proportion to the love and attachment sometimes that we have to something. So, you know, if we love this planet, we are going to grieve a great deal. We may be very angry too. You know, but the anger and the grief speak in some way to our connection, whether we're living it or not. Mm -hmm. And so for me, this is a moment to be authentic, to actually get in and live it, you know, feel it, pull away that veil that you're referring to. And it, it reminded me when you were talking of a moment I had forgotten, but it happened to me many years ago, but I was out walking in, in, the woods with the intention of not being veiled in any way. And I started to experience these emanations of love from every single leaf of every tree. And I was completely overwhelmed. I mean, it was unbelievable. And every needle of every you know, coniferous tree was like beaming love, not at me, but just beaming love. I ended up on my knees weeping because it was more than I could handle in a way. Mm -hmm. But it was, and it, you know, again, it may sound ridiculous, but it was my experience and it was a window for me into what is available to us all the time if we simply open to it. Exactly. Exactly that. And so why not? My God, you know, life's hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think, you know, I'm game for love wherever it comes from. Mm -hmm. Well, um, if it's all right with you, I'd like to, to shift gears on exactly that note. And, and go back to the first article that I had the pleasure of reading that, that you wrote a few months back. I, you may have written it quite a while ago, I don't, but the first no, time. Yeah, it was a couple months ago, yeah. Was re reading what you had to say about parenting in this, I, I call it a predicament-laden time that we're living in. And um, in the business as usual world or paradigm or way of thinking or particularly way of parenting, um, <clears throat> there's, there's not much more, um, oh, excuse me, <laughs> lovely, um, there's not much more charged, uh, like a minefield charged area of human experience that I can imagine than being a parent in these predicament laden times, in these times when we, you know, we're throwing around words like extinction of uh, not only millions of species, but ourselves. We're talking about collapse of systems. We're talking about post truth world. These, these uh, pieces of fabric that we, used to call so solid and beautiful and dependable are now shredded. And yet a parent needs to somehow bring their child into uh, the world in some way similar, I imagine, to what they experienced as a child growing up in the face of this 
the shredded fabric of our culture and of our world. Can you speak a bit to that article or to anything that you're inspired to say, um, to, particularly to that challenge, to that incredibly vital role and, and challenging role of, um, of being a parent now? Yes. I think this is maybe one of the hardest places for people to go, as a matter of fact. When I think of the title of your book, the impossible conversation. I think it's a ready-made description of, of the dilemma of how how do we how do we how do we parent properly in this time, or how do we parent to the best of our ability? I should say, and you know, I think we cannot proceed as our parents proceeded with, with us. I think it, it truly is a different time and children not only are wiser than we generally give them credit for, um, but they, they are on this journey with us. And they may be young, they may be small, they may be annoying, um, they may be naive, but they are human beings. And I want to go back to that idea of connection. We need to be connected to them. Um, we need to do, I believe we need courage in this time, almost above anything else. And that includes the courage to look at the facts, to look at ourselves, and to live from our hearts in the face of what's going on, mm -hmm. um, to live our truth and to live with love. And so that applies to kids. We need to do that and we, need to, we also need to respect them as, as other beings, just like I think we need to respect you know, the trees and the squirrels, I think, and the, and the, you know, the, gosh, the dolphins and the whales and the sharks. Um, I know that most parents are going to want to protect their children from what lies either ahead or upon us. And I think that this is uncharted territory. We don't have a roadmap really for how to do this well. So I can just offer what my thoughts are and my observations and my practices really are. And I think first of all, it's really important for parents and other people who are you know, with children, grandparents, honorary parents, um, to talk with one another about this uh, because those of us who are willing to look at the realities, we need each other's support and we need each other's wisdom. Uh, I, so I think that's a really important first step. The second thing I want to say is that um, we really need to um, decide or to know or to analyze a couple of things before we proceed. And this is kind of an overarching idea and it's, you know, it's not radical in any way, but I think we need to look very carefully at who our child is or who our children are. How old are they? Where are they developmentally? What's their temperament like? What are their support systems like? And then we also need to look at what's going on in our immediate circle. So, you know, if we're living in Houston or Mumbai right now, or Ashland in the smoke, um, we might be having a very different conversation than we would be, you know, if you're living in Berkeley. Um, the age of the child, the access of the child to information, you know, these are obvious things in some ways, but I, but I think they're good starting places. You need, to, you need to look at the lay of the land and, and see who your child is, what they can tolerate, what kind of a, a, a method they have for processing information and um, 
And then I think you need to look at your own feelings, your own reaction to what's going on. Know yourself and be honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. um, some of us are going to be in a lot of fear. And is that something you want to share? I mean, people do that. They share their fear with children in order to protect them. You know, do not talk to strangers. That's, you know, uh, that can develop a really big fear of strangers if, if mm -hmm. it's delivered from a place of fear, right? Um, so know, know yourself. Know how you feel about this really as clearly as you possibly can. Then the second thing that I think is really important is never to lie to your children. This really is about respect. You may not tell them the whole truth. You may tell them the truth that you feel is appropriate given who they are and what's going on in their world. Um, but it's important never to lie. It's fine. Everything's going to be okay. Um, I have a 13-year-old. She's almost 14, actually, in a couple of days. And she she's actually someone who did come to death's door. So she has an interesting perspective mm. um, that happened when she was eight. So we both have it interesting perspective um we cherish her life in a way that we might not have but we also understand that it's not a given um but but she is full of excitement and enthusiasm and plans and dreams and she's reaching into herself and finding this vast richness and she's just thrilled about it so to me, she is really living authentically. She is, she is having at it. And the last thing I want to do is say, but honey, this isn't going to last long. <laughs> Don't get your hopes up. He asked me the other day, is, is the world really going to end, mom? And I had to think, okay, so what is she really asking for here? Does she really want to know what's going on? Or is she looking for reassurance? And as I sat with it, I thought she's looking for reassurance. She wants to know that, you know, her latest crush or her, you know, her next performance is going to go well and she can put her all into both of them or either of them or whatever it is that is really thrilling her at the moment. And that's really important to me that she be able to do that. At the same time, I didn't want to lie to her. So, you know, I don't know what I'm doing any better than the next person, but I thought, what I want to say to her is, we don't know what's happening. You know, there are some concerns, there are changes coming, and we all need to be in our hearts to meet them. And that's what you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. That's the best I can do. <laughs> you know, yeah. I think, I think, but I think it's really important not to lie to them. Um, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, telling the right truth is really important. And sometimes that's hard to discern, but that's, that's our job. I also think it's really essential that we give our kids, if we do have the impossible conversation with them, we give them the space and the permission to have whatever reaction they might have. Um, letting them know that we're there to support them um, as we can, because we have to know our own limitations too. But, um, you know, some kids may just want to be in denial. Yeah. And that's, I think, what we have to honor. Um, some kids may freak out, and we have to honor that um, and be there for that. And I also think that it's important for us to um, think about what we can offer our kids in, to fill the void that is where the future used to be mm -hmm. and that's tough i mean it's it's a big void um and yet to me it seems like that's where we come to that question of connection and separation and really prioritizing connected connection is is a gift that we can give our kids being really present with them when we're with them helping them to be connected to nature um, and to other beings, particularly, I think sometimes people who are different, people who we might think of as other, um, but helping them to feel that deep 
fulfilling satisfaction of being part of the oneness. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that we can do. And then I think finally, it's really important that we listen to our kids mm -hmm. because they have things to teach us. We think we know it all and we really, yeah. um, I think can be surprised if we allow them to teach us as well as feeling like it's our job to teach them. Right, right. What you're, uh, what's, what really struck me in what you just said was to never lie to them, uh, to our children, as we try to um, help them get their bearings in this world. And um, I, I, I was drawn to, uh, there's a simple cartoon that uh, millions of people have now seen. It's on the, been on the internet for years now called the story of stuff mm -hmm. and um it's just I, I think it's maybe 15 minutes long is that familiar to you mm -hmm. i'd recommend it highly it's yeah. just fabulous and it's it's a very simple cartoon and real person on the same screen mm -hmm. piece of um how we do the human operating system to make the stuff and consume the stuff that we handle every day. And while it's light and airy and not confronting, it's also quite direct mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's not candy coated and it shows this can't continue. And you'd have to really be not paying attention in this short cartoon to not get there's something wrong, something unsustainable about this way we're used to doing this. And Sounds like a great tool. <clears throat> fabulous tool. One of the best I can imagine for a, literally a child of any age. Mm -hmm. As soon as they understand the language that's being spoken, there's no reason to, to not see it. It's, it's very non-threatening and you know, won't damage them or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And um, well, I'm not trying to compare my work to the simple beauty of this story of stuff. I, I went in with a similar kind of intention that I think that they had in creating that, which is you're left with their version of what I might call sober data. Right. And so I'm not being pounded over the head by someone else's interpretation of that data. I'm being given some data in a way that I can actually see it. And then it's not too difficult for me to say, hmm, I wonder what my conclusion is about that. And even though I'm, no, I'm not now an expert on the human operating system or production on the world or so on, I certainly have enough to be able to say, I can see that this is something I'm very concerned about. I want to learn more or uh, sort of interesting, but I really don't want to hear any more. Mm hmm Similar with the with the sober data, I um, I don't know if if you've had a chance to see that um, in the first couple of chapters I cover a lot of ground in the climate change conversation. Yes, and the different uh, conclusions from different analysts of how soon some serious stuff could be happening, more serious than it is now, and I. I really had to get out of there. I had to get out of there as quickly as I could because they, that's where the denial conversation lives. The, the multi-billion dollar denial right. conversation it, it lives there. And I, I don't know what else to call it, but really the ultimate in cynical lies, this denial conversation. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted also, even though I'm not a parent, I wanted to be able to share with others that which is not encased in lies in one way or another between myself and anybody I'm speaking with. Right. <clears throat> so I, I spent the next couple of chapters talking about other measures of, of our impact on the planet. Mm -hmm. And in, in a similar way, now that there are, there are many others, other uh, these story of stuff like cartoons you'll see a half a dozen of, of them slightly each slightly different than the other if you go to see it on youtube um what i think what i certainly what i was trying to do 
in the impossible conversation when I think they do very, very well in the story of stuff is to give enough information and enough of my own sharing of my own process in mm -hmm. grappling with this information and then say, here you go. If you would like more information about the uh, collapse of fisheries by 2040, here are some vetted links that you can pursue that or similar things with climate change and, and so on. And I think there's something extraordinarily empowering about that. And I've had a huge amount of success with, again, people very different from myself and also with young people mm -hmm. where I'm not trying to tell them what to think. I'm sharing what's so for me. I'm offering so, them resources if they want them. And Dean, I think, you, you know, what you did to a large extent and I think successfully was to use your own process of kind of coming to awareness as a template, um, which made it less threatening. Mm. Got it. Yeah. Mm. Um, and more accessible. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, you know, that all we can do well, I mean, we can do a lot of different things, I should say. But, but I think in terms of sharing information about what's going on, we can, we can tell our truth and we can tell it in a way that we feel is, is most accessible and most appropriate. Mm -hmm. And some people are going to listen and some people aren't. And I'm, 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 I'm thinking right now that it's got to be really, really hard if you are not capable of seeing a response that makes sense to this. If what you hear and see is, it's all over, it's a disaster, pack it up, you know, it's gonna be miserable and you're gonna die. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have the opportunity to see the invitation that lies in this time, if you don't have the skills or the tools um, to actually, you know, unwrap the invitation, as it were. Uh, so, so, you know, I just take a moment to say, I think what you and Carolyn are doing is, is really exemplary in a sense because you are offering people who maybe don't have those tools some kind of concrete um skill building skill building. Mm -hmm. so that they can make sense of this so that it can be a time of transformation and of deep and vibrant living as opposed to you know curling up in the corner and waiting for the end to come Right. Because if that, I mean, because if that's all you can envision, then denial really is a good strategy. Yeah. You know, I don't blame anybody who, you know, wants to go in that direction for themselves. I mean, I, I do have to hold accountable the people who don't really deny but pretend to die in order to continue to increase the size of their bank account and their power holdings. But true that. True that. So I, I'm curious, in, in the name of what you just said, <clears throat> I, I would say it that those of us who are engaged in stepping forward into this predicament-laden world and, and wanting to live as fully presence, presenced and present a life as possible in the face of it, it seems like we would, all of us, come up with our own versions of practices, each one intended to reconnect us with a primary source of meaning, our, our deeper selves, or each other, or, or the earth. And if, if that even slightly describes your process of day-to-day -day living, could you share with us some of what you do to stay connected in each of those realms or anything that you do to feel more fully presenced and present in your day? Yes, I can. I 
and I want to say first that I, I, I do agree. I think that, you know, we have probably passed the point where, you know, en masse, we are going to turn this whole ship around. And that means that each of us then becomes, I think, responsible for making of this life what we can and we choose to make of it. Um, and that, that means something different, probably for everyone, except for that it means we need to be as authentic as we can be if we really want to, if we really want to be in that sacred space that's offered by this time. So I actually don't do much that's very structured. I make a point of always spending some time outside or, you know, for some reason I can't be outside listening to the out of doors. Um, and, you know, sometimes I want to take a walk and sometimes I just want to sit. Um, but, but I really do want to feel into the earth. I want to feel into the other beings that are around, you know, whether, you know, it's just urban squirrels or little brown thrushes or ants. Um, I just need to make a point of connecting. Um, that grounds me, that reminds me of what is true. And um, so that's just something I have to do every morning is just spend, and it's, for me, it's probably five minutes I need to do it. But doing it for five minutes with intention means that throughout the day, it continues to present itself. So I can be driving somewhere and I'm on the freeway and I see a tree that just takes my breath away and, I'm, and that veil is lifted. Um, so that's, that's, um, that's my goal is to stay conscious as much as possible. And the practice that I use is just to make sure that there's a small amount of time at the beginning of the day to do that. I also um, am a channel and I um, have a book of daily readings that, um, are useful to me. And I also have um, sort of downloaded a number of very short practices that uh, people can use to kind of just connect with joy, connect with nature, connect with themselves in, in ways, you know, and they're all designed to take less than five minutes a day, really, because, you know, people are busy. Um, so, um, you know, sometimes I use some of those and they're, you know, they're varied, but they're pretty simple and straightforward. And that's your book, Love is the Way? Yes, it's called Love is the Way. Daily Offerings from the Guides for Living Luminously. Nice. Would you let folks know how they can find you in, in the interwebs and how they can find uh, more of your writing? Yes, absolutely. So um, my sort of political writing or my bridge writing, I would call it, um, has appeared in Counterpunch, in Dissident Voice, and in Common Dreams to date. So, and you know, the articles are archived under my name, Elizabeth West. And I am also an intuitive counselor. I work with individuals to support them in accessing their own highest wisdom and guidance for living with as much joy and um, delight and love as they can. Um, I work with energies hands-on and at a distance. And um, I also work a lot with children energetically and animals. I love that. Um, so um, my book is available on Amazon. You have to look pretty hard, Elizabeth West common name but the name of the book is love is the way that'll that'll get you there um and um i have a website which describes all these things um the address is or the url is www.loveslonging one word dot com loveslonging.com mm -hmm. so. well, before i let you go i i'm curious if we both just sit quietly for a moment 
in this moment, mm -hmm. from where you're sitting, is there anything that you would like to finish up our conversation with? Anything that you would like to offer to the folks that are, will be listening some point in the future? Is there one last thing that would, could be a cherry on the top of this Sunday? I think we frequently get drawn into thinking about the ends, what the results are. And in this moment in time, we have no idea, we have no control really, which is perhaps always the case, but we know it's the case now. <laughs> we, we can't deny that. And that means that what we have left is the means. We have the moment, we have the next moment, and we have all the amazing resources that dwell in us. We are both human and divine. And I think that the soul of the world would very much like us to live everything that we are. So. Mm -hmm. That's that's my prayer is that is that as many of us as are willing will do that. Mm -hmm. And and that will be its own beauty in the blaze, perhaps, but mm -hmm. beauty nonetheless. Well, Elizabeth West, this has been an absolute delight, and I hope it's not the last time that you and I get to talk and hopefully somehow soon we'll be able to meet in person. Until that time, I will look forward to um, really diving into your book and also any uh, new writings that happen to come about. And uh, thank you so much for all that you brought to us today and all that you bring to your writings in, in life in general. And um, warmest blessings to you all, to you and to us all. Thank you so much, Dean. Alrighty, for the Poetry of Predicament podcast, we're signing off. Well, thanks for listening to the Poetry of Predicament podcast. It's produced by Dean Walker and the Living Resilience Alliance. We're at livingresilience.earth. Music provided by Michael Hedges, Aerial Boundaries, and Port Blue into the Sea. Hope you'll listen to our sister podcasts, The New Lifeboat Hour and The Impossible Conversation Podcast. You can find that at our uh, YouTube channel. Just look up any of those names of podcasts and uh, you will find it there. You can also find The New Lifeboat Hour at carolynbaker.net. Enjoy. Look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.